Okay, this is another Star Rider repair video. This one, I'm working on this board down here, a VGG board, that's having a problem with the video. Here's what happens. So, the error that I'm getting is 141, which means bad video RAM. And I actually replaced the 141 already before I started filming this and it didn't seem to make any difference. I'm also noticing that there seems to be black horizontal lines. There seems to be black horizontal lines uh, a lot of places. So I'm wondering if this really is a problem with video RAM or something leading up to the video RAM. So I'm going to look at the schematics and see what else it could be besides just video RAM. Okay, I noticed on the schematic that there are um, even the even lines and the odd lines columns are separated by this chip which is a 74LS139. Looks like the even lines are controlled by this uh, this part of the chip and the odd lines are controlled by this part of the chip and so the video memory will not get written if these are malfunctioning. So I think what I'm going to do is take a logic probe and put it on the right lines of the video RAM and to see it, to see if any of them are never being written to and also check to see if the output enable is firing on all the RAMs. Another thing that could be wrong is there's this horizontal prom that dictates where the um, the the DMA address maps to the video video RAM. It took me a long time to understand how this thing works. So if this is corrupted, then there's going to be problems. Although I think this is less likely. But it seems like there's probably something wrong on this something on this schematic sheet that's probably wrong. Uh, there's, there's also a possibility that it could be these pixel shift registers which control rendering to the screen. But if these are bad then the video RAM tests would probably be passing. It could also be these 244s down here which can which handle data going from the DMA data bus to the video RAMs. But since I'm seeing um, weird behavior with um, black columns that are seem pretty symmetrical, I'm going to start looking at this one first, this 8.6, and see if it's behaving correctly. Okay, before I got too far, I did a continu continuity test. And a lot of these pins between the memory that are supposed to be connected are not connected. So I don't know if there's traces broken underneath these sockets. That's probably... That seems fairly likely. And some of these weren't... Some of these that aren't socketed still weren't connected. So I at least need to fix all the continuity before I even consider whether the RAM might be bad. Okay, since I'm expecting to have to add quite a few jumper wires, I decided to pull these three RAMs out of the board and add sockets just so I don't ever have to do any soldering on here ever again if the memory goes bad because these RAMs are kind of notorious for being flaky, 4416s. A lot of um, people who have Williams games will, will replace them with something newer so I'm expecting to have to maybe do that in the future. Anyway, um, here's the places where the three sockets were before, then I desoldered them, and I don't know if you can tell, but the holes are looking a little rough. I wouldn't be surprised if some traces were broken. But then on the top ones, these are the ones that I just barely desoldered, and I don't know if you can tell, but it looks pretty clean. Like, I don't think I, did any, I caused any damage, and I just wanted to talk about how I accomplished that. Um, the first thing I did was I used my um, Hacko desoldering gun to get most of the solder out and I was hoping that 
I would get enough of the solder out so that the chips would just fall out, but they didn't. And so since I was like really concerned about destroying any traces on this board, I ended up using this chip quick stuff, which is actually designed for surface mount removal. And it's not designed for through hole, but I decided to try it because I really didn't want to destroy anything. And so I just put this chip quick stuff on and what it does is it makes it so the existing solder will melt at a much lower temperature and stay liquid a lot longer. So what you can do is you can heat up all the pins at the same time with a soldering iron and it will stay liquid for like 10 seconds and that will give you enough time to <clears throat> pull the chip out. Um, since it's pretty easy to do a surface, surface mount, harder to do a through hole. So what I did was I got all of the pins um, pre prepped with this chip, chip quick stuff and then um, I grabbed this hot air station and had my son hold um, hold the nozzle on, pointed toward the back of the board and then while he was doing that keeping it heated up then I used this um, chip extraction tool and gently worked these rams out of the board and it looked like it it looks like it worked really well the traces look really healthy on this side so I'm going to take a picture of <coughs> I'm going to take a few pictures of how the board looks on the top so I can see where the routing is going then I'm going to you know, clean up some of the flux install sockets and then do a continuity test and then install jumper wires everywhere that there's broken traces and then after I've got all that done, then I will actually test to see if any of these rams are good or bad or, or not. Okay, I got all the jumper wires installed for the places where the traces were broken on these sockets. And there were a total of 16 wires that I had to install, which took me literally hours. And I've just finished testing, and I think everything is finally... All the continuity is finally where it's supposed to be, so now I'm going to install the RAM and turn it on and see what happens. Okay, so I'm still getting the same error. The CPU program is telling me that 141 is bad. And I tried swapping it out and um, with a different one, and it didn't seem to help. So now I'm pretty sure that the RAM itself is probably not the problem anymore. It might still be. There's always a chance, but since it's telling me that the it's telling me the same RAM has the same problem as before, and I can see visually that there's something else that's wrong, I think I'm going to look elsewhere for where the problem is. It kind of looks like there's a problem with the the logic that maps um, a CPU coordinate to uh, to the video RAM. It seems like the vertical, um, whatever calculates the vertical row, seems to be, um, seems to have a problem because it seems like, it kind of looks like the graphics are smeared vertically. Oh, wow. And there's black vertical lines. So I don't remember what ca what helps calculate the vertical coordinate. So I'll have to look at the, the schematics and refresh my memory for what does that. But that's probably a good place to look. Oh wow. Look at that. So he's supposed to be up here, but it's marrying him down here. <laughs> That's kind of a cool effect, actually. Yeah, since seems to be something with the vertical coordinate calculator. Okay, I wrote a little um, ROM program for the Star Rider CPU board that all it does is it fills the background with one color, then puts a single two pixels in the middle of the screen right here and so that's what it's supposed to do if it's working 
So here's what it's actually doing on the real hardware. It is putting the dot up here, except there's four, dot, four dots instead of one. And then there's also two down here. And then um, every one of the columns is always black. So it's black and then a color, black and then a color. So it looks like there may be more than one problem on here. Okay, I think I've had a breakthrough. This is pretty exciting and I need to explain quite a bit of stuff for this to make sense. So I've removed all of the RAM except, well there's six RAM chips. I've removed all of them except for two because I want to remove variables. And I wrote a test program that's supposed to draw a red, a single two pixels of red kind of up here in the screen, but as you can see, it's drawing six of them. And the reason there's these lines is because, like I said, I've removed most of the video RAM except for two. So these, these blue areas are basically where there's no, there's no RAM connected. And these green lines with the red dots, those, that's where the RAM is connected and where I can see that there's a definite problem. And I've hooked up the logic analyzer to one of the DRAMs, pretty much capturing everything I can capture on this thing. All right, so that's I explained that. Now let me explain what my what the program does that's running over there right now. So what it does is it fills all of the RAM with a color, which is basically just color eleven. Well. It's color one because there's only 16 colors. And, and 11 means that both pixels in the byte are gonna be the same color, green in this case, because I set, I set color one to be green. Then I take color two and I just put it in a random spot, which hap I just happened to choose 5142, just randomly, just because it was kind of in the middle of the screen. And um, remember that 51 is the X coordinate and 42 is the Y coordinate. Okay, so what it does is it stores the pixel at 5142 and then it goes one row below 5142 so it goes to 5143 and it just starts it starts reading the RAM value back from the video RAM and if it gets all the way to the bottom 51FF then it loops but if it find it compares to make sure that the color value is equal to 1 and not equal to 2. If it finds a color value that is not equal to 1, in other words, uh, an unexpected problem, then what it does is it will loop endlessly. So the program will basically lock up at the spot where it found a problem. And what I, the reason I did this is because I want the program to kind of loop in a problem area so I can kind of see what it's reading and I also want to see what value is going into the RAM because it kind of, since, since um, there's like this weird behavior, it kind of looks like the RAM itself is probably not bad. It looks like the mapping to the RAM is bad. But it's been hard for me to prove that because when I put the logic probe on the pins of the chips that do the mapping, everything seems to be fine. Or, I see activity. I, I'm not saying everything seems to be fine, I'm just seeing activity, so it's not, it's not an easy fix where I see, oh, you know, this, this data line is stuck high or stuck low. Okay. So now I've explained that. Now here's where you, <laughs> here's where you really gotta buckle your seatbelt, so to speak, because this is, this is where it gets complicated. And I think I've explained this before in this video, but I've been filming this over the course of several days, so I kind of forget what I've, what I've already done. So the X coordinate, the column, goes through this prom and comes out the other side, um, slightly translated. The Y coordinate just comes through um, unaffected, and the modified horizontal coordinate and the the unmodified Y coordinate go into these four 74 153s and these are um, the schematic calls them DRAM address muxers and this is where I originally suspected the problem was 
but putting my logic probe on here um, I didn't see like I said I couldn't I couldn't prove there was a problem so um, but now I think that there is a problem with one of these and I'm gonna explain how I found it it was actually pretty uh, pretty complicated so first of all there's these two signals that come in mux 0 and mux 1 and so that, since there's two signals that means it's a 2-bit number that has a range from 0 to 3 so it can be 0, 1, 2, or 3 when the number is 0 or 1 it is the video hardware sending the current video RAM out to the monitor so this is this is how the screen gets you know refreshed you know 60 Hertz is by these two values being these two bits um, forming a, a value that is 0 or 1. Now when these two bits are 2 and make a value that's 2 and 3 that's when the CPU and the special blitter chips that's when they have the opportunity to read the RAM and write the RAM. So when the MUX is 0 or 1 then these addresses are going to be controlled by just vertical and horizontal counters and they can't be modified by the the game program they're just it's basically just the position of the CRT beam so when these are 2 or 3 then the CPU can and the blitter chips can access the RAM, ac can access the RAM and these these four muxer chips are the things that facilitate that so um, the MUX value is inputted into each one of these chips and depending on and then over here these inputs depending on what the input what the MUX value is these inputs will output two output two bits and these two bits that are outputted go into the address of the DRAM and become the internal address of these six DRAMs now it gets even more complicated than that. You thought that was complicated, but these DRAMs, um, they have eight bits for addresses, but internally the, the internal address is actually 14 bits. And so what they do is they have these strobes called RAS and CAS. The, the R stands for row and the C stands for column. And what you have to do is you put the row on the address bus first and then you bring the RAS strobe low and then you put the column value on the address bus and bring the CAS strobe low and then you can actually read or write to a position inside these DRAMs so it's <laughs> so trying to hook up a logic analyzer and see you know what's see what values are going on is actually pretty complicated and okay so so I wanted to see whether the address I just want to see whether the addresses were correct that was being set. So I looked at this complicated schematic, tried to break it down, make it simple. Um, I started with my, remember I chose an arbitrary address that's 5142. So that's my starting, that's my DMA address. I verified through emulation that this prom will convert the, the 51 coordinate into a 1F and the vertical byte does not get converted. So then I took the vertical byte, broke it up into bits, which I wrote down here. I took the 1F, broke that up into bits here, and then I followed the schematic logic down here to construct what the row value and the column, column value is going to be. And so I did that here and I can I concluded, concluded that DA, DMA address 5142 eventually gets converted into a row address of 9F and a column address of A0. Whew, okay, now let's go to the logic analyzer and see what's actually happening. So this, sp this spot in time is where my program is writing this, this 2 value to memory look to DMA address 5142. So this DRAM is going is supposed to get a 2 written to it at that address. And as you can see right here, there is a 2 being written. It's, um, it comes from these data bits right here. And up here is the address. So right here, 
is the spot where the row gets sent. Remember the row gets sent and then the column. So the row strobe goes low and, the, and then we look at the address lines and look at this. It's supposed to be 9F but look it's actually 9D. So one of these MUX chips is passing in the wrong value for my address, 9D. Now, let me change this. The other address, remember it was supposed to be A0, and we can see right here, it is A0. So it looks like the MUX chip is mostly working, at least for this. But when it's supposed to be using an address of 9F, it's coming up with an address of 9D, which something like that is exactly what I was expecting to find that would cause this problem that I'm seeing on my, you know, the real hardware. So I double checked my math, triple checked it. I think this is correct. Now, oh yeah, so one other thing. Remember how I said my program, as soon as it finds a problem, it's gonna loop? So if we just fast forward here, um, on this lo logic analyzer capture anywhere and let's see let's go right here see look address 9d is where the problem is it's expecting to find a, a one value but it's reading a two so that's a problem and let's just change the I'm going to change this to make sure we're... Yeah, and the other address is A0. So I think this is it. I think this is the problem. I think it's, 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 expect, it's supposed to be writing uh, to 9F, but it's writing to 9D, and so um, anytime... Yeah, well, yeah. This, this is definitely the problem. I don't know if it's, okay. I don't know if this is the problem, but this is definitely a problem. So I just need to replace that, um, that MUX chip and everything should be fine. And the reason this is so hard to find is because look, here's the, here's the data line that's the bad one. It's bit one. But look, sometimes, sometimes it's working properly. So, it's the, chi the the bit isn't like completely bad it's just partially bad so trying to find this with a logic probe would have been pretty much impossible so the only other thing i could have i could think of that would have found this problem is just to assume that something's wrong with all of these and just pop all four of them out and replace all four of them and and just oh yeah it seems like that fixed it I mean you'd never really know which one was the problem but now at least I know I can like zero in and it's probably the 73 since it's bit one so I think if I replace 73 that should that should get me closer I don't know if that's gonna fix everything but that should definitely get me closer so I'm gonna work on that and report back okay got a new socket installed and a different chip installed in U73. So I haven't hooked everything up yet, but let's just see what happens. Hmm. Same problem. Okay, so replacing U73 didn't work, and I've got a lo logic analyzer capture of what the problem is. The problem is basically this, that when B2, um, which is an input to U73, is high, then B, which is the output, is supposed to also be high, but in this case it's low. And then a little bit later, um, it works correctly. B2, which is the input, is high, and the output is also high. But for some reason it's low right here. And I've already replaced U73, so the only thing that could be causing this to happen, in my opinion, is either I got really unlucky and my replacement has the exact same problem, which, which seems very unlikely, or it could be that B is tied to another line which is pulling it low. 
Or it could also be that B2, which the input is a little bit shaky and it's not, and um, U73 is interpreting it as low when it's actually high. But I'm thinking that it's probably that B, which is the output, is tied to another line, especially since I did a bunch of soldering. Um, this line comes up here and is actually connected to all it's connected to every single RAM. So if any of these RAMs that I resoldered where I added sockets has this line shorted to another line, that could be causing this problem. So that's probably where I'm going to be looking next. I'm going to be looking for uh, something that's connected to this line that shouldn't be. And if I don't find that, then I'm going to be really stumped. Okay, so I think I found the problem. Uh, pin 13, which is A1, seems to be shorted to pin 6, which is A6, which is definitely wrong and probably is what is causing this problem. So here I thought I was being really clever and you know, doing all this diagnosing, like, oh, U73 is bad, I need to replace it. But it's actually probably just bad soldering on my part yet again. This is actually pretty disappointing. I thought I was finding something really clever and really hidden, but it's just a bad soldering job. Okay, I found where I think the problem was, so let's see what happens now. Oh, that's looking much better. Now there's just a single red dot on there instead of red dots all over the place. I'm going to put the rest of the RAM in and see if it still looks good. Okay, all the RAMs are installed again. Let's see what happens. Okay, so there's my red dot like I'm expecting. But as you can see, to the left of the red dot, there's a problem. So that probably means that one of the RAMs might be bad. But fortunately, I have installed sockets for all the RAMs, so it's really easy for me to remove RAMs and test things out. Okay, I replaced, let's see, I replaced this RAM twice, apparently both of these are bad, I replaced this one twice and now I'm seeing the screen that I expected to see. So now I'm going to unload my custom ROM and put in the regular Star Rider ROM and see if um, all of the tests pass. Okay, here we go, Ooh, that's looking good. That's looking good. <laughs> and now it doesn't have a ROM board installed, so yeah. So let me install the ROM board now. We should see some text. ROM board installed. Let's see what happens. There we go. All right. Let me hook up some inputs and see if I can run the attract mode. Alright, inputs hooked up. Let's go into diagnostics. Oops. There we go. Yes. Yes. There we go. The disk test. All right. Very encouraging. All right, let's go back to the track now. Okay. Well, looks like the problem is fixed. I'm happy to report there were some bad RAMs and then um, <laughs> some not so good soldering on my part, which pains me to say, but sad but true.